Hello, hello, welcome to the news. It's our weekly cultural roundtable. We're going to do something a little bit different today. I don't think we've ever, maybe we have, who knows, it's been it's been many years now. <laughs> but I don't me- remember ever talking about commercials, specifically as culture. We are going to do that today. I'll explain exactly how and why in just a second. We're also going to talk about the odd triangulation of Joe Rogan, Neil Young, and Spotify, and how that wound up, and whether it portends other things. And then our kind of uh, premier featured item is the book of Boba Fett. Uh, it's on Disney+. Plus. It's a prequel to something and a sequel to something else and a spinoff from something else. It's unbelievably complicated to know even exactly what the heck is happening. <laughs> Except it's not. It's also a very enjoyable, happy Western kind of thing. Uh, but to explain all of that or help us understand or help us at least understand that we don't understand... Uh, one of our panelists today is our resident Star Wars expert, Pedro Soto, uh, president and CEO of High Grade Precision Technologies. Uh, Bill Usman is a professor of media studies at Sacred Heart University. And Bill Usman this week celebrated a fairly significant milestone birthday. And that's kind of why. Woo! It's kind of why we're talking about what we're talking about here in the very first segment. Uh, although it's been on my mind that we should do something with these commercials. And by these commercials, I mean the progressive insurance commercials. I know I call them Geico in the promo. I'm sorry. I'm an idiot. Uh, But it also maybe illustrates that they're not really great brand awareness commercials. If I really, really like them and I enjoy them, but I'm not sure which insurance company they are for. Uh, but the, they, if you if somehow or other, if you've never watched a commercial ever in the last two years, uh, they they're on all the time, uh, and they and we don't seem to mind for once. Uh, they feature this kind of brusque. A mustachioed expert named Dr. Rick, who is an expert in something like called like parentamorphosis, I think it's called, which is you're turning into your parents. Uh, and so he's constantly dealing with these people who look like they're maybe in their 30s, uh, but they are acting like they are in like Bill Usman and my age range. <laughs> uh, so we're going to give you a little sample of this. This is the uh, airport sequence. The airport can be a real challenge for new homeowners yeah. who have become their parents. Okay, everybody, let's do a ticket check. Paper tickets. We're off to a horrible start, but we can overcome it. We're not going to point out our houses, landmarks, or major highways during takeoff. Don't buy anything. I packed so many delicious snacks. They're... Nope. Did you say ballpark when group two is going to get boarded? Two hours and 58 minutes. Progressive can't protect you from becoming your parents, but we can protect your home and auto when you bundle with us. Someone should have left home earlier. So, um, actually, there's a whole category of people, and I might be in that category, who blanch uh, when Dr. Rick takes the package of snacks that the woman has packed instead of buying expensive airport snacks and throws them into the bin. Uh, There's a whole bunch of people who, as much as we might like those commercials, have a little bit of a problem with that moment. But but Bill Usman, since it was your birthday this week and because you are now really kind of officially old, um, we really (laughs) felt that this was... And first of all, I'm going to say that you will recognize more and more of yourself in these commercials as, t- as time goes on, yeah. unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, but there's something really great about them. I don't know. Do you, you have uh, media studies the theories uh, about what's so great about them? Sure. Uh, I mean, let's start with acknowledging that I am a sexagenarian now. Mm-hmm. And and that doesn't mean I'm casting aspersions <laughs> at myself. That's, that's actually what this is. And... Uh, I have felt myself uh, becoming my father uh, for quite a while now. If you look around at the piles of newspapers that I have stacked up that I say, oh, don't get rid of that. I'm going to get to those uh, soon. Um, And of course, I never get to them. Uh, This comes out (laughs) in lots of different ways. But, you know, uh, from a media studies perspective, um. I'll, I'll, I'll just take myself as an example. I actually don't see many ads these days because there are all these technologies, whether you're streaming video or whether you're using a DVR that lets you skip through ads. Um, I have seen these, but only because they happen to play them during basketball games a lot. Mm-hmm. And that's one of the few forms of media that I still watch live as it's happening so i can't really skip the commercials this has presented a tremendous problem for the advertising industry and in order to deal with it 
they've had they've used a lot more product placement for as one strategy, but as another strategy, making ads that are really really entertaining, so that you don't want to skip them, so that you look forward to them, so that you want to stick with them. And I think that's that's definitely what's happening with these ads. And I agree. I think they're really humorous. I think you said in in our emails, Colin, that they're better than like most of the skits on SNL these days. And and I agree with that. They are like these little mini kind of little comedic skits that I think generally work really well. I do find myself laughing at them. Right. And and I should say that one thing that I did uh, was I went uh, online. Uh, I can't remember whether they're hosted on YouTube or on the Progressive website or both, but uh, you can watch lots of lots more Dr. Rick, including a lot of stuff that's just solo Dr. Rick. He's an actor named Bill Glass, by the way, who's in a series called Rutherford Falls and, and apparently was on Justified, maybe briefly, but uh, I feel like his career is about to take off. But but they're not as much fun. There's something so rewarding about sitting there. They're also, by the way, on during football games and baseball games. So, yes, you're watching a sports event. You got to sit through these commercials. And when one's good, you're just so grateful for it. Going on the website and watching eight of them in a row, oddly enough, is not anywhere near as satisfying. But Pedro, Agreed. as a yeah. person who is not mm-hmm. old and decrepit, uh, <laughs> in, in many respects, you're the kind of the target well, for these ads, though, because the, the theme is kind of a precarious theme. But it's it's that, yeah, you're going to buy a new house. You're going to turn into your parents. And somehow right. or other, that means you need progressive insurance. But um, I don't know. How do they land with you? Yeah. No, they're, they're square in the wheelhouse. I mean, they hit pretty hard. You watch them and it's like, oh, uh, I'm doing those things. Uh, I think that they're also, um, they have this like kind of Christopher Guest, you know, kind of vibe of uh, this kind of sort of pseudo documentarian thing, which I really like. And uh, they're definitely, um, they are just like Bill said, uh, commercials that you don't pause or fast forward through. So they're always really funny to watch. Um, even, Even repeated like a second or third time, even if you watch the same one. I definitely went down the rabbit hole of YouTube to see how many more there were. Um, and I actually liked kind of mini binging them a bit. They <laughs> definitely don't, you know, I, uh, you know, shift me over to, to, to progressive. I think that much it's like, you sure. know, bundling your car insurance is a pretty basic concept at this point. But I guess if they're hitting a target market of new homeowners uh, who might be a little younger than I am, like in their thirties, cause I am not, <laughs> uh, that, you know, maybe that point is a little bit more salient. Right. I, I do want to say that, first of all, uh, yeah, in our emails, I, I quoted Mike Nichols. There was a documentary about him where I saw I just sat up straight. He made, he said this thing about there's two reasons for a joke. One is that it's funny mm-hmm. and the other is that it's you. And by you, he meant <laughs> identifiable, I, you know, something mm-hmm. that and, and I just think these are really, really good that way. And I think they're also unlike we just did a whole show yesterday about generations. And I think unlike a lot of sort of, I don't know, intergenerational Hatfield and McCoy sniping, these are not cruel. They're not mean. They're not hostile. And the fact that Dr. Rick himself is kind of a borderline jerk means that like some of his criticisms, you know, they don't land maybe that hard. It really is, you know, I think if (laughs) I'll just... I just relate on a couple of personal notes. In, in, in my, and I should say that Pedro and I are sort of, we are related by a combination of marriage and divorce or something. Uh, <laughs> we, are, we have sort of a complicated family connection. So um, in, and somewhere in that connection is frequent guest on this show, Steve Metcalf. And I used to make fun of the noise that Steve Metcalf made when he would sit down or get up. You know? and, I, <laughs> and I now make that noise. It's, it's coming for you, Bill Usman. I make that oh. noise. Um, oh, I've had that noise for, for, for years now, Colin. And I also have to add, there's some cultural aspects to this as well, because that noise in in my world is also accompanied by, oi. Yeah. I, uh, <laughs> you know, you're standing up, you're sitting down, and you get the oi right. as part of all of that noise. Absolutely. And so, I mean, I, that's one of the things I like about it, Pedro, is this, they sort of get mm-hmm. things right. And, and you know, I mean, I was even watching some of the individual Dr. Rick things today, and I was I was thinking about another person that we are both kind of related to, uh, mm-hmm. who I will not name, but who's a one, lovely and wonderful person, but has turned into that kind of parental generation person who has like an enormous amount of keys, like enough keys to like beat a bull alligator to death with, you know? And I was thinking, 
know, I was just sort of thinking that's something that also ha- there are all these things that happen, and and I yeah. feel yeah. like you know. Pedro, they, they probably just talk to a lot of people to kind of because the, the tropes they come up with just they ring so true. Yeah. One speaking of ringing, one of them, which I really laughed at was, uh, you know, one of the uh, online ones was, you know, uh, if you see a uh, unknown, you know, this is an unknown phone number. Do yes. you answer it? <laughs> no, <laughs> you hit ignore and you go about your day. You do not ask how they got this number. You do not ask, uh, you know, to, uh, you know, how their day is. Uh, or what they what they want, you just hit ignore and go about your day. Thank you. So or, definitely, with, like, yeah. <laughs> In that particular string, also there was a thing about he begins by says, so "Here's a question: How many things should you clip to your belt?" And then he goes, <laughs> trick, he goes, he goes, trick question. And the answer is nothing. You should. But then he shows like you know somebody with a f- cell phone and some keys and all this kind of stuff, and it's all kind of clipped to their belt in very different different ways. And so yeah, Bill, I feel like there's there's so little culture either commercial or non-commercial culture, that's really kind of affectionate about hum- yeah. mm-hmm. human beings and their transitions, that I think this thing is, is worth cherishing on that basis alone, if no other. Yeah, they really are gentle. You know, it's it's mocking, yes, but it's not, as you said, it's not mean-spirited. It really, it easily could have fall, fall, fit, fallen into an ageism trap. Uh, and I'm becoming more and more sensitive to ageism every day, um, as you can well imagine. Um, it doesn't fall into that trap. Um, it, it's kind of gentle. It, I would say maybe like in a Ted Lasso gentle kind of way, uh, mm-hmm. and not just because of the mustaches. Um, <laughs> and so, it, it, you know, it, it's like you're... It's that teasing that you do not because you're trying to humiliate someone, but because you love them. You, it's that it's that gentle teasing that Lori and I do with each other all of the time. Uh, and I learned a new word from this Washington Post article that we read about this mm-hmm. uh, introjection. I had never heard of that. Introjection is the phenomena of humans absorbing the attitudes, values, or traits of the people they spend the most time with. Uh, So that makes, I didn't know the technical term, but oh yeah, like, of course that happens. I can see my, I can see my father in me. I can see me and my kids. I can see Lori and me taking on phrases and mannerisms uh, that, that maybe we can no longer remember which one of us it originated with oh yeah i see that yes oh no that that's so interjection is so is such a thing uh pedro also knows my son and my son uh Mm -hmm. you know in his adolescence would impersonate me all the time in my absence i didn't see this and then at a certain point he forgot that these were things that he was making fun of (laughs) you know he just (laughs) says them now like they're okay to say and that's the other thing that's kind of funny about these commercials is that the people who are doing this you know, there's another one where they actually go to a football stadium and he, so he's with all these kind of young adults or, you know, middle adults or whatever. And and they're right. just worrying about like, well, should we leave early? Where should we park the car? We can get out really. <laughs> we're going to leave like 15 minutes early. Right. And, and there's something really funny about that, because, of course, they're the wrong age to be thinking in those terms. All right. We, well, yeah. we should we should segue uh, to something a little bit more serious than the delightful Dr. Rick commercials. And, and that is um, a, a peculiar triangulation among uh, the talk show host, Joe Rogan, the almost uncategorizable talk show host. I think like right wing talk show host doesn't really quite get who he is, um, although I'm not sure I do get who he is. And, uh, and Neil Young, the uh, veteran rock star uh, and Spotify, the streaming platform. Basically, the way this works is that Neil Young Becoming aware of the fact that Joe Rogan circulates a lot of very inaccurate medical information about the pandemic, thus possibly putting people in danger, Neil Young said that he couldn't be on the same streaming platform as that person. He'd like his music removed, if that's the way things are going to be. But he kind of also said... It's either me or him. And, well, they just invested more than $100 million probably in getting Joe Rogan. So guess what, Neil? Uh, Don't let the door hit you on the way out. Uh, And that's the way it's worked so far. Although, Pedro, I mean, there was also this kind of sense that Neil Young, you could sort of tell that he was waiting for other people to kind of fall in with him. You know, who's with me? (laughs) It turns out nobody so far. Yeah, go ahead. I mean, I guess he was asking other artists, I think, to kind of join and maybe make this into a boycott, which, 
I think would make it a lot more complicated. I mean, to his defense, he did have, there was a, a letter from, I think I mentioned it was like 270 scientists and medical professionals asking Spotify to basically do the same thing um, with, I guess, a little bit more standing than Neil Young. But um, so I do kind of understand the point he was trying to make uh, in, in being very concerned or being associated kind of with a platform that's allowing the dissemination of inaccurate medical information to a very wide audience. Yeah, so let's let's pick this apart a little bit. I should say that um, some conservative um, commentators did a deep dive on those 270 names and found uh, a lot of them were kind of PhDs and stuff and not exactly doctors or clinicians or biomedical researchers. Let's set that aside for a second, though, because, Bill, this is something that I know that you're wrestling with, this whole question of, okay, so, um, you know, it does seem as though some of the platforms have decided that even though they will tolerate quite a bit in terms of transgressive content, um, that whole idea of circulating inaccurate biomedical information, scientific information that really could uh, cause someone else harm uh, if Mm -hmm. absorbed, that's sort of a a breaking point for YouTube in particular lately. Uh, Also, Mm -hmm. Facebook, Twitter are dealing with that Mm -hmm. same question in different ways. Um, On the other hand, uh, I don't know. I mean, there's something about Neil Young trying to get Joe Rogan taken, quote, off the air. I realize he's not really on the air, but uh, off the stream. uh, That uh, is a little jarring. Yeah. And um, I am, as you said, wrestling with it a little bit. I think that it's I do think this is actually more complicated than it might seem on the surface. I, I understand a lot of people's impulse, and I feel this myself, to just be totally and completely team Neil Young and, and, to, and to cheer him on and to be totally on his side in, in this argument and, and, and this battle. I, I get that. My instincts uh, push me toward that. But then there's like this little whisper you know, it's like it's like the, the the classical liberal is 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 whispering in my ear. Wait a second. We're not talking about um, the company deciding to uh, to remove Joe Rogan, which they're not going to do because we can't divorce money from this issue. Capitalism will tolerate anything if there's a profit in it, you know, we, we know that, you know, Naomi Klein wrote a book called disaster, you know, the shock doctrine, disaster capitalism, capitalists see a disaster like COVID as a way to make money, but it's not them doing it. I would be fine if Spotify said, this is just too much. We're not hosting this anymore. I actually wouldn't have any objections to that. I know some people would from a classical liberal perspective. To me, it's, Another person who just happens to be, another creator who just happens to be on that platform has said, you know, if if they stay on the platform, I'm not staying on the platform, which is an attempt to kind of control what is included in this thing that you just happen to be disseminating your music over. And there is something a little worrisome to me about that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, that's not where my worries come in. My worries, um, well, first of all, I should say I, I'm kind of in a similar bind to Pedro in the sense that I don't really know all that much. I mean, in terms of actually having personally absorbed Joe Rogan con, uh, content, I, I'm not deep into him yet. I'm going. One of the things I've decided I'm, I'm back teaching uh, about political media, political journalism uh, in the poli sci department at Yale, uh, and I've told my students we are going to spend you know, half of one class session talking about Joe Rogan, which means we're going to watch Joe Rogan, try to figure out, like, what is this thing, you know? Uh, I'm I'm a little nervous about just the way that we react to content that we don't like, although I'm also right. really, really concerned uh, about the just collapse uh, of legitimized medical information. But there are a lot of players in that. I mean, you could argue that somebody who had minimized the importance of asymptomatic spread, who had uh, who, who had sort of tapped the brakes about the idea that the virus was airborne, who had uh, at one point said uh, that uh, citizens wearing masks, 
masks was not a good idea, that that kind of person should be severely restricted, except I just de- described except. Anthony Fauci. Anthony Fauci, Anthony right. Fauci did right. all of those things, and he's corrected for all that mm-hmm. stuff. And and so kind of there is a, a way that one man's meat is another man's poison. There's a way in which, you know, yeah, I think Rogan is a really super toxic guy, uh, but typically in a society like ours, we – the conversation has to be more developed than that somehow. I, I'm not exactly sure, and, and Bill, since you aren't either, how to develop that conversation more. But, right. but Pedro, uh, we'll uh, let you finish up this conversation. <laughs> I, yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard, I think. You know, Bill has a, a great point in terms of kind of this deplatforming and, and kind of saying, okay, like you're either in or out um, at the kind of creator level. I guess maybe my thought is, is what's the, the thing that I'm struggling with or trying to think of, well, what's the creative way to be able to, um, not creative, but a more constructive way to be able to, to have this conversation so that the ultimate end game isn't to amplify the misinformation, which is kind of what's happening here, but you're not, you know, creating sort of standards that may arbitrarily shut out people who are kind of on the outs at any given uh, era. Um, I think that ideally, um, really, the platforms have to stand for something, um, norms and standards. Um, you know, I mentioned in the article, kind of in our pre-conversation about uh, the importance of of having those in any sort of environment. Um, I actually think that uh, one of the companies who is coming becoming a media company, I guess, has been for a while, but is now directly one that really does that well. I think is actually well. They have some problems, but in, in large ways, they do it well. It is Apple, who who really does, you know, know what they stand for, right? L- LGBTQ rights um, and things like that. They're actually trolling Spotify, I think, today, uh, welcoming Neil Young on the on the uh, on onto Apple Music. So, you know, I think that like um, ultimately, maybe at the, at the platform level, but then how do you influence them to be able to encourage them to take a stand? And maybe that's you know Neil Young. May have that was kind of the only tool in his arsenal um, to do that, and maybe we need better tools. Right. I said we were going to end there, but I, now I want to get into one more place, which is I think everything that you just said was very, very right and very, very smart. And th- these these things that start out as platforms, you know, a platform is kind of fundamentally a, a kind of a neutral concept. A platform doesn't have opinions. Opinions sit on top of the platform. So they start out that way. That was a problem for Apple. Apple, even though mm. podcasting actually t- contains the name of the Apple product on which podcasts were initially <laughs> yeah. supposed to be listened to. For a long time, Apple said, we don't know anything about podcasts. We're not involved in podcasts. We're not going to rank podcasts. We're not going to do anything about the whole podcasting ecosystem. We just make a piece of hardware that people listen to podcasts on. That's the limit of our connection with this, and for you know this, and so there's a growing mm-hmm. process. And and Spotify for a long time just hosted music, you know, but then they got into the podcasting biz- business, and now they're pr- producing their own content. And different obligations come along with this. But but Bill, since you're the media studies guy, I think we should at least make one point, which is one of the reasons that these particular kinds of initiatives, like the one Neil Young took, are doomed, is because they energize the other side. You know, I mean, how. Howard Stern, yeah. all of Howard Stern's fights with the FCC were nothing but great for Howard Stern. Uh, Dan Bongino has just been uh, plat- deplatformed by YouTube. That is only going to help uh, uh, Dan Bongino's cause. Uh, there's a couple of young guys who have a podcast on YouTube called Fresh and Fit, which is kind of misogynistic and has some <laughs> some pretty unpleasant points of view. And their constant efforts to deplatform these guys. And what they do is they turn that into their content. That's, that's the most exciting exciting thing going on on the show on any given day now is that they're trying to deplatform us. Uh, and so, right. Bill, I mean, people should learn that lesson too, right? The more you step on something, the more it squeaks. Yeah. And that's not, that's not a reason not to, you know, to, to, to raise these mm-hmm. issues and not to call out the liars and the propagandists and the dis- disinformation people. That's not a reason not to do that. I don't think we should shy away from that because of that but it does definitely give them fuel they live for this i mean i think joe rogan is thrilled that this happened and i think all of his supporters and all the anti-vaxxers are you know they're 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 energized by this so you really have to think about well what is your ultimate outcome 
What are you looking for? I, I have tremendous amount of respect for Neil Young. And one of the things that I learned is Neil Young is a childhood polio survivor. Mm -hmm. And so he, you know, he's got a personal skin in this game. But, you know, are you just trying to make a stand? Is it just about your own virtue ethics? Or is there something you're actually trying to accomplish in terms of the larger, you know, ecosystem of information and disinformation? And if it's the latter, we do have to think of other ways to do this because it's not going to accomplish what we think our goals are. All right. Now we really do have to end this segment. Uh, for two consecutive days, we ended our first segment with Neil Young music. Yesterday it was Old Man, which would be good for the progressive commercials. Here's a Dr. And me. Yeah. And for Bill. <laughs> That song is called Hum to Dum Dum Hum to Dum 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 Hum. Uh, it is the theme music to the book of Boba Fett. It is composed by Ludwig Göransson. I actually really do like that uh, theme music. And before we plunge into the book of Boba Fett, I just have to say one thing because I forgot to say it in the first segment, and I'm only saying it because it totally indicts me, which is that two days ago uh, there was a conversation in my house featuring me, my partner, and my partner's daughter about home repairs that we need to do, remodeling that we need to do. And I, I sort of said, well, before we do any of the kind of fun, sexy stuff, we really got to deal with how much heat this house is leaking. It's just leaking heat all the time. The furnace is overworking. And they totally Dr. Rick rolled me on that. They just went after <laughs> me. Uh, and uh, and I had it coming. All right. So uh, so Boba Fett, I discovered that there were nine different actors that played, played Boba wow. Fett, despite the fact, Pedro, that in terms of the actual Star Wars canon, the nine film Star Wars canon, which is what we used to live with, He's not really, you know, he doesn't really loom that large. Explain who who is Boba Fett. Uh, remind people. Um, well, I, I actually in, in the three movies, I believe, or in the movie season, I believe he has twenty seven lines total. <laughs> um, it may, it might be even twenty seven words. It's, it's not very much. Uh, but Boba Fett is uh, a bounty hunter. First seen in the actually seen in a Star Wars holiday special, but first seen by most people in nineteen eighty. Uh, in Empire Strikes Back, who is chasing Han Solo uh, on the behest at the behest of Jabba the Hutt, and um, he is a very quiet, uh, you know, fully armor clad person that you whose face you never see, and who has really, um, you know, a lot of uh, has gotten legions of fans I think over the years because really he's he's sort of a non entity. He's just this fantastic looking uh man of few words uh who you know is just clearly uh you know a uh, bad uh badass character uh so that's kind of the rambling boba fett in a nutshell um but over the years he has since become significantly more uh developed uh with a lot more backstory and uh now we're seeing it on tv yeah so uh uh, Bill, for you and you and I, we are not strangers to Star Wars, but we're not Pedro either. We're not. Uh, we don't. <laughs> we just know what we know. Um, so it wouldn't have occurred to me that a series about Boba Fett would make me like Boba Fett, would make me find him kind of a person of rather heroic proportions uh, that would, in fact, invite me to have some affection for this character. But uh, in fact, that seems to be what's happening to me anyway, watching the book of Boba Fett on Disney Plus. Like, I really like this guy. Yeah, I like uh, Boba Fett. 
He is nice to animals. Uh, he seems like an honorable person, even though he kills lots of things. Um, he seems to be somewhat introspective uh, as he's dreaming away in his super duper hot tub, which if you've seen it, you, you know what I'm talking about. Um, I, I knew nothing about Boba Fett. Because I, this, I am, you know, the name of the first episode is Stranger in a Strange Land, which of course is a reference to that Robert Heinlein novel. Um, but I am such a stranger in a strange land when it, when it comes to this. I was on a previous episode of The Nose with Pedro when we talked about The Mandalorian, but I don't think I even finished that series. And um, I know so little about this that when I told my kids that we were going to be talking about this on the radio uh, uh, today, I said, uh, we're going to be talking about the book of Baba Fett. And my, <laughs> my son said, Dad, before you go on the radio, I should tell you it's Boba Fett, not Baba Fett. <laughs> Uh, so right. And also, Dad, don't pack your own snacks for the radio show either. Exactly. Uh, but despite that, I am kind of enjoying this. I do think it, I think you get a lot more out of it if you are a Talmudic scholar of Star Wars like Pedro <laughs> is. But I think you also can enjoy it just because it's, it's, it's got good performances and some levity. It looks good. It sounds good. I'm trying to imagine you know, a, a, a Talmudic scholar. Uh, you know, if, like if a man has two banthas and three daughters. Um, all right, so yeah, Pe works. yeah, Pedro, what were you about to say? So, you know, the interesting thing about it is that it may actually work for people who are 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 kind of less uh, steeped in this in terms of the character himself. I think in right. terms of the show and, and what they do, there's a lot of storylines that go into a lot of other kind of Star Wars media, which people are really loving. Um, the interesting thing is that I think in some ways the Mandalorian's story is more in line to, I think, where a lot of people thought Boba Fett would be heading, which would be the silent man who never takes off his mask um, or takes off his helmet, um, kind of wandering the wastelands being a bounty hunter, where in this one, he's actually not, right? He's a basically, uh, you know, dances with wolves, you know, has a, he has an epiphany mm -hmm. and becomes, becomes a, 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 kind of benevolent crime lord uh, who wants to kind of be in control of his own <laughs> destiny. So, it, it, you know, it's a very different path than I think a lot of people were. Uh, I think the, the, the Mandalorian's path was probably the one that a lot of people thought was going. In. And instead, because that was taken by, you know, that fantastic series, I think they developed something different. So the interesting thing is that, um, you know, the character himself, when you go into the there's this whole animated world of Star Wars that Dave Filoni uh, mostly created, um, which is the Clone Wars, um, Star Wars Rebels, the Bad Batch, and even going back to the original uh, prequels where, you know, Boba Fett himself is actually a clone. Um, and he's the same clone that all the stormtroopers kind of, or the, you know, uh, came from. So there's, you know, this whole concept that in fact he is one of, probably millions of people that look identically like him um, is really explored in a lot of things uh, before. And so, you know, the character himself, I think there's, I, I think there's... we're going down a bit of a womp rat hole here. Uh, <laughs> but um... I, I, I think that, I think that Pedro should write the, the, the Boba Fett book for dummies. Right. And then I'll read yeah. it. All right, and so we can talk about I want to play a clip here. Uh, I want you to hear at least the voice of Tamuera Morrison, who plays Boba Fett, uh, and his terrific uh, second-in-command, right-hand person, Ming-Na Wen, as Fennec Shand. Jabba had many vessels. We've got a lot of ground to cover if we are to keep his empire intact. I can make the rounds without you. Jabba rarely left his chambers. Jabba ruled with fear. I intend to rule with respect. If I may. Speak freely. In difficult times, fear is a sure bet. So they're both kind of bounty hunters and assassins and stuff like that. But they and I, I, once again, I don't want to go down a womp rat hole either. But it's probably worth noting that <laughs> that half half of this 
series takes place kind of sometime after if you if you remember the original Star Wars the 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 core original uh, first three movies uh, there's a, a moment where uh, Jabba the Hutt who is uh, who figures who's constantly being invoked in this particular series he's on some kind of gigantic air sled that I'm sure Pedro knows the name of and people start falling off into this hole where this horrible thing is that takes like a hundred years or a thousand years to digest you uh, and and that's kind of where we meet both of fat. He's kind of being digested. He's getting tired of it. Uh, and and so there's that. And then there's a time way after that. And so it kind of ping, pings and pongs back and forth between those two time periods. That all sounds extremely confusing. But I, I found... Oh, and I should say also, uh, Pedro, I love your analogy to Dances with Wolves. In this case, the the, the native people, the indigenous peoples, w- would be w- 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 the people known yes, as Tuscan like the Raiders. Tuscan Raiders, the Sand People. Yeah, yep. and so uh, and they, they, if you remember them from the very first ever Star Wars movie, they're sort of troublemakers in that movie, and they're you know they're sort of getting in the way of Luke Skywalker doing what he needs to do. Uh, but um, but in fact, a, a great amount of sympathy is ginned up for them, and so I mean. Pedro, if you could even just sort of take off your own Jedi helmet for a moment uh, and just uh, look at it. I, I feel like this kind of works as a Western, you know? I mean, if you, if, yeah. if, mm-hmm. in fact, the, if you could even just flush out everything you know about Star Wars and it still kind of works. Absolutely. I think this and The Mandalorian have, you know, they, they're, they're kind of playing with genre in a really great way. I think also to throw in, you know, Godfather Part Two with kind of the two concurrent storylines. Yeah. Uh, and the past and, and the stuff and um at, you know as a western i think i even said this with mandalorian i love the fact that these um shows are they tend to be smaller stakes um they tend to be they let they they breathe there's you know just time to just spend with the characters um the storyline just kind of unfolds not in like a you know 90 minute 120 minute time frame but over the course of several things so you really can kind of just have fun and enjoying it. And yeah, the story is, is as, as a Western, I think it is, um, you know, it, it is kind of this like gangster Western. And um, I, I think that they're also having fun with it. Uh, with the, the characters, the cameos, I mean, there's amazing cameos, especially in, in Book of Boba Fett uh, that are just wonderful to watch and, yeah, it's it's really it is it's a it's it's enjoyable. I think sort of at any, even if you're like sort of moderately interested in Star Wars, um, it's just very well done. Yeah, Bill, you know that that whole idea of having fun with it. So they do. Uh, and one of the things that I brought up, I don't know that anybody found this particularly mm-hmm. interesting, is there's a way in which more and more, I mean, so what George Lucas tried to do is what they call world building. He tried to kind of create a world, a Star Wars world that was, you know, fully separate from the lived world that the rest of us are in, but still have characters where that were recognizable human beings with whom we could identify. It's a tricky thing to do. And and as the series gets moves more and more away from its origins, I think it feels more and more uh, free to play around with stuff. So to me, you know, American idioms are really starting to creep in here. <laughs> and, and there's a scene with Amy Sedaris playing this kind of outlaw yeah. rogue mechanic. I'm not even exactly sure what she's supposed to be. But I mean, she just sounds like somebody from Brooklyn to me, you know, this kind of kind of hyped up uh, person who's probably running a chop shop uh, up in the Bronx or something. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, and I just wonder whether that, Bill, maybe you and I wouldn't even know, but whether that kind of violates the the kind of internal consistency that some Star Wars fans would like. Yeah, I don't know if it, uh, how Star Wars fans would feel about that. I would say sort of just kind of a, um, a, a, a Western, uh, not Western like in terms of, you know, uh, mm-hmm. like, you know, Western film, but just Western culture, because then some of it is very British as well, as you heard in, you know, some of the accents and some of the ways that they interact. So there's, you know, this American thing at times, then there's this British thing, but not necessarily a lot uh, other than that. Um, So I don't know how like hardcore, uh, Mm Star Wars fans would feel about that. I know, you know, Jonathan McNichol, for example, he had, I, th- I, I think, more problems with it than I did because of what he knows. 
you know, if you're not a hardcore fan, if you're not into the Star Wars deep cuts, which is what this feels like to me, I think maybe some stuff mm -hmm. goes down easier than it would if you do have knowledge that complicates what you're seeing. But I do like just, the, you know, that that Amos Sedaris character is a lot of fun. A lot of the, the value in this is through the performances of some of these people who pop up so you're like oh there's Danny Trejo and there's yeah. Jennifer Beals and there's Stephen Root and you pointed out Sophie Thatcher uh Colin is recently on Yellow Jackets and it's almost like she's playing the same character uh, you know with the shag haircut so I think a lot of the enjoyment that I had for it had had nothing to do with you know the the Star Wars universe and so um you know, there's stuff in it that might be actually easier for people who are not hugely part of the, that that yeah. culture. Yeah, just yeah, yeah. I go ahead, Pedro. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think that like, you know, the fact that it's it's stretching and having fun and going kind of where the story takes it, rather than having this sort of, you know, I think this dogmatic of like what is Star Wars and what is important, and you know, the fact that they're moving away from that i'm really happy about because i think it makes better stories and like you know going on the secondary characters um my absolute favorite is you know his his name in the in the show his name is is carson tiva and he may not even be named but he's played by uh, paul sun hyung lee uh who is uh, appa from kim's convenience and he plays basically like a an x-wing traffic cop and he is just the best part of the show just this harried guy just wants to get oh, you know, that guy home. that guy <laughs> yeah yeah i liked him yeah. a lot yeah so He's um fantastic we probably have to and, wrap and, this up uh, wrap this up now i just do want did, did want to say one last thing which is that uh in terms of uh, the point about it also being somewhat british i mean hilariously in this thing the sophie thatcher character and sophie thatcher does play the young julia lewis in yellow jackets but she's in this thing she's part of a gang of these kind of bikers on these air bikes uh who are the color, yeah. and they're called the mods. Well, like the mods were part of a yeah. like 1960s mods versus rockers British biker cult <laughs> feud. I mean, that's such a deep cut into history. I also want to say one last thing about Boba Fett, and I really do enjoy the series. But Boba Fett has this unique way of kind of suborning or recruiting people who are against them, against him, which is he just says, "Well, why don't you join me?" <laughs> and it works every <laughs> single you. time. Every yeah, every. Single time they and, go, and okay. I'll pay you. Here's yes. some coins. Right. I'll, okay. I'll join yeah. you. A anyway, um, yeah, I think we all kind of enjoyed the series in various ways. Uh, we'll now, it's called The Book of Boba Fett. It's on Disney. Plus. We'll take a break. We'll come back. It was a blockbuster summer. Moving pictures got us through to September. And then I'm worried about me and you And I made it half new and half true There was a blood-sucking summer I spent half the time trying to get paid for my savior Swishing through the city center I did a couple favors for these guys Who look like Tuscan Raiders All right. So in the last couple of days, we were lucky to have uh, Katie Tularski and Gina Matruda do some work for us uh, in the booth, uh, running the board as our technical producer. But it never feels right unless the technical producer is Kat Pastor. She's back today. That's great. Jonathan McPants is always the producer of The Nose, which means he's the producer of this particular episode. Thanks to both of them. Our guest Pedro Soto uh, and Bill Usman uh, are going to make some recommendations now. Bill Usman, why don't you get us started? Okay. Um, there's two that I want to squeeze in here, so I'll try to be pretty succinct. The first one is um, because uh, Justice uh, Stephen Breyer announced that he will be retiring. I wanted to endorse uh, a book that he wrote in that came out in 2016 uh, that's called Against the Death Penalty. And the title tells you what you need to do. No, he makes a I think extremely cogent argument that the death penalty violates the US Constitution because it does constitute cruel and unusual punishment. It's not a long book, but you know, it's it's I brilliantly argued as you might expect, succinct 
And um, I just think a very compelling argument uh, against the death penalty by Stephen, Stephen Breyer. And then the other thing is, it's a little tentative. It's, it, we can think of this as like a pre-recommendation because this starts on Showtime on Sunday. It's a docu-series called We Need to Talk About Cosby uh, featuring W. Kamau Bell. I like W. Kamau Bell a lot, so I'm pretty confident that this is going to be worthwhile. And I think it's going to take on something that that's is is really important because you know everybody knows about Bill Cosby, but I think people may have lost sight about what a hugely important cultural figure he was in the past and how important he was uh, to the diversification of Hollywood and television. And then, of course, you know, everything that has come out since then. I think this documentary is really going to try to unpack that. So let's consider that a tentative recommendation, but I'm pretty confident that this is going to be worthwhile. All right. Uh, we're probably going to do a nose episode about it, too. Um, all right. So, uh, Pedro Soto, what are you going to recommend for us? OK, I have um, two as well. Um, one is sort of like a, a concept. But, um, you know, when it, I've been looking and watching um, at home a lot of kind of 30 minute um, well done comedies. So I have kind of the, the collection of them. If you, I mean, everyone, a lot of them have been talked about, but um, um, sex education on Netflix and never have I ever are two just great shows about young people, which are, I just can't get enough of. Um, and they're only a half hour long. Um, and then obviously Ted Lasso, as everyone's talked about, but also, uh, Acapulco on Apple TV, um, is another one, which is, uh, just infectious. It's fun. It's, um, you know, about someone who is, uh, this wealthy man recounting his lives in the 1980s in Mexico. Um, it's bilingual, um, which, you know, resonated a lot with, with me. It really is not one that has cultural appropriation um, sort of in it, even though it's about Mexico and told in, in the English language. Um, so that general concept of those shows and those are the ones I would recommend because they're fun rather than jumping into an hour, hour and a half long show <laughs> that's really deep. These are really um, very well done. And the second thing I have is... Um, in, in the deep uh, realm is I just finished the final book in the sci-fi nine book series um, of The Expanse, which is Leviathan Falls. Um, and so for anyone who has been reading, um, you know, Game of Thrones, Song of Ice and Fire and hated where the TV show ends and is, is you know, never going to finish that series, um, you know, or won't finish for another 10 years, uh, this is the... Uh, the sort of uh, series slash shows for you because it is nine books where the authors uh, finished. Um, so you can read it. It's an absolutely fantastic tale. Um, and the TV series itself is also very well done. And that has been cut short. It ends at season six, which is roughly book six. Um, but also uh, both of them stick the landing. And both of them, if you um, like Battlestar Galactica, if you like that kind of real world sci-fi uh, uh, are both worth watching either together or independently. All right. Very quickly. Uh, 30 minutes is too long for comedy. Three minutes. I think I endorse this at the end of every star <laughs> uh, at the end of every Star Wars uh, episode that we ever do. Eddie Izzard, Death Star Canteen. That's all you need. Make sure you get the Lego <laughs> animated version of Eddie Izzard, Death Star Canteen. And then James Austin Johnson has developed the most incredible Trump impersonation I've ever seen in my life. I'm going to recommend on the Seth Meyers show. Just fi find the clip. James Austin Johnson reveals the secret to a perfect Trump impersonation. Skip the the first seven minutes. You don't need the first seven minutes. Just listening. Listen. Listen to him doing Trump talking about a wizard. Yeah, 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 yeah.